This is episode number 31 of the Fine Dining Podcast. Welcome to Austin. This is Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast. Helping foodies discover new restaurants and new friends. Here's your host, the founder of Mystery Meat, Seth Ressler. Hello, and welcome to Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Seth Ressler. This is the podcast for foodies who love travel and travelers who love food. Here's how it works. Every week, we go to a different city and we try and find dining. We talk to a local food expert, somebody who really knows the local culinary scene, and we frankly get their recommendations. And today, we have a first for us on the Fine Dining Podcast. We have a filmmaker, David Barrow, who's making the film Farm City State. David, thank you so much for joining us. You're quite welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, I'm excited to have you. And not just a filmmaker. We should point out you are an award-winning filmmaker. Uh, you've won awards at Telly and International Film Festivals. So that's, that's very exciting to have you here. That's the rumor. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk to you about your film uh, and find out a little bit about Austin. You've got a great restaurant recommendation for us. And then we're going to play a game called Out of the Frying Pan. Before we get to all that, though, you've got a trivia question for me about the city of Austin, right? It's kind of a doozy. I like it. And it's something that I learned through my research for the film. All right. Hit me. Part of East Austin and going east of the city was one of the properties in the United States that grew the most of what crop? Grew the most of what crop? It was very, very large crop producing area for one specific crop. And it's not anymore, huh? It's not anymore. Uh, how long ago are we talking? Uh, within the last century. Within the last century. All right, here's how we do. And you know, you know this. I, like I say that I can't think of the answer and, and we'll come back to it. But you, you're, I can't fool you. You're a filmmaker. This is a cheap ploy to get people to listen longer. So <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. They can listen as long as they want. <laughs> All right, so we'll come back to that and we'll get an answer to that. So talk to me about your film. Talk to me about Farm City State. What's it all about? So Farm City State is an independent documentary that I've been researching for a long time, and it finally got all the puzzle pieces put together in the summer of 2012, where I had been living in Austin for 18 months and met locavores and urban farmers and protein producers and protein procurers and all these people who had the same passion, and that was to feed Austin. And so I asked the question, well, what if Austin could feed itself? And thus the movie started coming about. And so far we are in production and working really hard to make sure that everyone gets to see this message. So the big question here is, can Austin feed itself? True. And what does that mean exactly, feed itself? I mean, just using food that is grown within sort of city limits? Interesting question. So the only California and New York actually have definitions of mileage for what defines local. Texas has yet to do this. What we're trying to do is just say, can Austin feed itself with local, healthy, organic food that is produced in and around the city? We have beef producers. We have pork producers. We have wild game, which is unique and an amazing resource here in Texas. Uh, but then we have this urban farming movement that's happened here because of the arable land within the city limits. This is one of the few places in the United States that actually has arable land within city limits. So when you say urban farms, you know, I get this image of uh, having a chicken coop in my hotel room at the Marriott. What do, what do urban farms actually look like? Uh, well, urban farms could be something as simple as driving down the street of houses and the next thing you know, you have a three to four acre lot that is growing produce. Um, think about a community garden that is located within a neighborhood or within a business district. It's just land that is being farmed by either one individual or a group of individuals. And in practice, who's actually doing the farming at these farms? Is it everybody's volunteering and giving a little bit of their time? Is there somebody who's actually paid to run it? How does it normally work? Well, here in Austin, all the urban farms are actually paid owners. One is a person who used to own a restaurant. One of the other urban farmers used to run the landscaping business in town, and they turned their 3.86 acres of land into farmland that they sell to restaurants, sell to the farm stand, sell uh, to wholesale. So in terms of 
sheer numbers. I mean, when you did the research, does Austin actually produce enough food to theoretically serve the number of people that live there? That's a really great question. So Austin produce all, if you put all the farms together and all the people who do proteins and everything, there is a whole lot of produce being grown here in Austin. The issue is consumer education. There's not enough people buying it. So we have unsold produce, which the farmers are smart about it, and they will compost this unsold produce or give it away to myriad nonprofits, uh, Salvation Home, Caritas, needy schools or anything like that, which is just brilliant. But it's the consumers that either need to buy more and demand more, and the farmers will be able to grow more. What is the argument against locally sourced foods? The debate against local food is that it's too expensive, is one of the common misconceptions of it. Um, We are attempting to prove that wrong by having a chef guide for our locally sourcing family in the film, uh, teach them how to cook. And if they utilize the entire ingredient, your costs go down. So one misconception is overpricing. The other misconception is, is that it's not as high of quality. Uh, But it's been scientifically proven that if you pick something at peak ripeness and then eat it in a quick amount of time um, relative to its peaking, let's say under three days, that the nutrients will be there. So the quality of it is actually high. And then the third argument is that it's not abundant enough. Well, I've seen with my own eyes abundance of food that is going to feed chickens and ducks and other livestock here in and around the Austin, Texas area uh, because they're not being able to sell it to the public because the public won't seek out the farm stands and they won't seek out the farmer's markets. There are people in Austin that are helping build or closing the circle of the local food system, and it's these composters. There's two groups, break it down, and then the other one called the East Side Compost Peddlers, where they'll go and collect all your compost from farm-to-table restaurants, regular commercial restaurants, residential areas, etc. And they pick up that compost and deliver it to urban farms to break down for them to use as compost on their farms. Really? So the guys who make a living essentially providing what I I guess would be the fertilizer, right? That would go back and be used back in the farm. It's closing the circle. It's a brilliant idea. The East side compost peddlers are doing it completely sustainable too, because they ride around on bikes with 55 gallon barrels and deliver their compostable materials and food wastes back to the farms. They gift it to the farms. They're not even selling it to the farms. They gift it to the farms. And then that, is then breaking down on the farm and then being used to make better soil for the farms. And this is waste that otherwise would wind up in, uh, I assume, a plastic garbage bag in a landfill somewhere where it's not doing nearly as much good. Exactly. So talk to me about some of the most interesting people you've met in the course of making this film. Uh, Larry from Boggy Creek Farm. He is the patron saint here in Austin. Boggy Creek has been around since 92. It is the oldest organic urban farm I know for a fact here in Texas, and I would hazard a guess in the United States. It is over three acres. Um, They have a very strong following. People love going and visiting him, um, and he's always got a smile. He's always making you laugh. Uh, The last time I went there, he ended up gifting me a wild boar rib that he had smoked the night before. Wow. Uh, And then... You know, the chefs and some of these locavore people that I've been meeting. I mean, we have chefs that have gardens behind the restaurant, like James Holmes of Olivia, or we have chefs that distinctly follow an all local diet. Um, and that would be Chef Sonia Cote of Hillside Pharmacy. She throws a supper club series called the Homegrown Revival that will forage and procure local products. And then that's all that's served. And so she doesn't even know the menu until the day before or the day of each dinner. And they become these raucous affairs where people come together and you might have a CEO sitting next to a a hipster and they get along because they're eating over food and they're having a good time. Are there legal constraints, you know, especially when you start getting into restaurants, are there things that they have to watch for or be careful of? 
yes, there are barriers for restaurants and there's barriers for certain people to get good food out there. Some of the barriers are that here in Texas, we, in, in probably many other places in the United States, is that although there are these large invasive species like wild boar and axis deer, which are both succulent, brilliant animals to be able to consume, they can't be sold in restaurants. Why is that? There are legal ramifications that the USDA does not game meats to be resold because they don't know what they've eaten. They haven't controlled their diets. They haven't controlled their migrations. And so these questions lead people to believe that they might be toxic, which they aren't. Right. They're living stress-free, cage-free lives uh, where they ramble around on pasture land and forest land here in Texas. And then the only thing that is going to be known to them is this wildlife. And then the next thing we know, a hunter encounters them and that hunter gives the communities access to that good meat. Um, And there's only one company in Texas that is able to process wild game and it's called broken arrow ranch. Um, And the only reason they can do this is that they have a USDA certified mobile processing unit. What is that? Picture an 18-wheeler and the trailer of the 18-wheeler is a cooler and a processing floor where they can, well, I mean, quite literally process the deer, hog, etc. So they skin it, butcher it, etc., put it in the cooler. And we're talking within an hour of being hunted That animal is inside the mobile processing unit in a cooler. Wow. Now, there is one gentleman who is a Texas representative. His name is Eddie Rodriguez from District 51, and he has started the very first bipartisan farm-to-table food caucus here in Texas um, and in the United States, for that matter. It's the very first one. And what they're trying to do is, A, educate people. B, address food accessibility. C, make sure that our farmers might get tax breaks. I mean, there, there are farmers out there that their property taxes went up 400% over the last year. Jeez. Because the city goes, this land would be better used for condos. And so is this gaining traction, this caucus? Uh, yes, it just started. It raised a lot of money over the fall of 2012, and it just started in this session. I believe they have... 19 different senators in the Texas Senate that are helping it out right now and educating their constituents. And they're hoping for more. Um, If you go to the Texas Farm to Table Food Caucus website, you can learn all about it. And it's it's a brilliant effort. And I wish them nothing but the best. All right. Well, and we'll post a link to that up on the Mystery Meat website so people can go check it out. I know that you are following a family as part of this film. Tell me about the challenge that you issued to them. Right. So one of the things that we wanted to do was dispel the myths behind local food, local food being expensive or local food, people not knowing what they want. Um, And so we had certain requirements. A, the family had to have children because children eat a lot. They they snack a lot. They're also fairly impressionable. um, And it's rather hard to dictate your life whenever you have children in your family. So they needed to have children. They needed to have a food budget each month. And our challenge to them was to remain within their normal operating food budget. And how much did you give them? We worked within their certain percentage of their income. So let's say if they usually spent 15% of their income on food per month, that's how much they had to spend on our 30 days of sourcing locally. Wow. Uh, And so they had to have a food budget. Then they also had to allow the film crew at any moment to have access to them. We have scheduled certain days with them, but we have also surprised them several different times. (laughs) To make sure they're not cheating. (laughs) uh, And those times have been fairly interesting, um, specifically because it's Girl Scout cookie season here in Texas. Uh. They have three daughters and one of the girls is a Girl Scout. So I noticed a Girl Scout package of cookies that was open on the kitchen counter. Now, granted, we challenged them 
to attempt to eat local for 30 days. We did not require them. They don't lose points or do anything else. I mean, how hard is it to get local Thin Mints? <laughs> I mean, where do you go for that? It might be harder than when you and I would think. <laughs> yeah, so we're following them around, but we've also given them access to a chef guide, like I mentioned earlier. We've given them access to a locavore guide. And then we've also given them access to a farmer. So the chef gave them a tour of a farmer's market and then took them home and taught them how to cook certain things, uh, certain techniques, recommendations for things. And then she has been available via email, phone, and text for the past several weeks. Um, the locavore is a woman, bless her heart, she's amazing. She has not been to a grocery store in three years. Wow. She sources all of her food locally. Now, obviously, toiletries and except like that, she orders online. Right. But she took them for a tour of all the urban farms and answered questions and was very gracious and kind of gave them recommendations on how slowly to integrate certain things in your diet and what are the hard parts. Um, here in Texas, local milk doesn't come easy. And the only milk that we do have is raw milk. So milk has been hard for them to get. Yeah. So like milk and then just snacks anyways, you know, their snacks are fairly hard for, you know, kids to give up, but we've recommended getting popcorn from one of the farmer's markets vendors that actually grow their own corn and then pop it and sell it at the farmer's markets. And it is delicious. So obviously this rules out, you know, pop tarts and Cheetos and things like that. But is there anything else uh, that we would kind of think of as a staple that this experiment ruled out for the family? So this is a diverse family. The father is African-American. The mother is a Latina. And uh, their three kids are these beautiful, precocious girls. The one thing that they always love and that has been incorporated into their diet are beans. And Texas only has a couple of different types of beans. They have black eyed peas and they have butter beans. But black beans brown beans, kidney beans, et cetera, do not grow natively here in Texas. And so this has actually been something that they have missed. And I completely understand it. And the mother even told me just the other day, she's like, I can't wait until I have beans again. I'm, going, I'm just fine with that. I mean, does the diet get boring when you do this? Does this limit your options? Normally, Americans can source anything that they want whenever they want. Whereas in a local diet, you're sourcing seasonally. And so to be able to recognize that you need to plan ahead and be patient for certain seasons, like right now, strawberries are coming in. Well, why not buy some more strawberries and either jam them, freeze them, or make sure that you eat a certain amount right now so that you know that you're not going to be getting them in August. Right. You know, we get, we get tomatoes in the summer here. So why not buy extra tomatoes and and can them. I mean, these are old habits. These are things that people have been doing for thousands of years and hundreds of years or whatnot. And we're not doing them anymore. I, you know, I'm ashamed to admit that there are tons of foods that I have no idea when they are in season and when they're not, because I'm just so used to being able to get them all the time. That probably wasn't the case, maybe just two generations back, three generations back. Right. And, and that's exactly what this family who is going to be part of the film is all about. I mean, they are a test market case for what it would actually be like for modern day people to source locally. I mean, their trials and tribulations, their advantages and disadvantages are something that we're going to be able to see and find out for ourselves. What about the budget? Has that been an issue for them or have they been able to do it just fine on the, the budget you allotted? I'm actually fairly surprised. Right now we are three weeks into their 30 day local diet and they have actually told me that they are under their budget. Now, this is for two reasons. One reason is that they used the chef's recommendations and so they turned a chicken into several meals instead of one meal. So they took the chicken and might have used a portion of it for one dinner for five people. And then the next dinner, they repurposed some of that chicken. So they had roasted chicken the first night. But then they used that roasted chicken in tacos the next night. The third night, they not only stripped the chicken of its meat, but then made stock out of its bones so they could do soup 
the following evening. So they are stretching. They're using the full ingredient. And so they've therefore been able to keep their budget low. That's really interesting. What is the most surprising thing you've learned in the course of making this film? There are people out there that have never seen a live chicken. You mean they don't come breaded and with barbecue sauce? They don't come breaded barbecue sauce and they don't come in a package that's <laughs> orange in our grocery stores. Uh, another thing is seeing the young girl's eyes and their facial gestures whenever they notice the taste difference between things. They tasted broccoli right off the plant at one of the urban farms. And they go, oh, my God, this doesn't taste like the frozen broccoli we eat at home. I know you got an opportunity to film inside some restaurants. Tell me what that was like. So one of the things that we were really honored by was being able to film during dinner service at three different Austin restaurants. Uh, this was an, an honor. Um, to be able to see the action, to be able to see the orchestrated efforts of a group of team being able to produce food from its raw ingredients to a work of art on a plate is not something that everyone gets to see. And the majority of these ingredients were grown locally. Oh, that's great. Well, I can't wait to see that in the film. When do you think people outside of Austin will have an opportunity to see this film? I would say summer of 2013, uh, this movie will go outside of the state of Texas. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much. The film is Farm City State. Uh, you still have a restaurant recommendation, and we've got a trivia question that we've got to answer. Plus, we're going to play Out of the Frying Pan. That's coming up in just a sec. Okay, before we get back to David, so much to tell you about. I really got to get into it. Uh, first and foremost, Taste Trekkers. This is the nation's first food tourism conference. We are putting it together September 20th, 21st, 22nd in Providence, Rhode Island. Fantastic city. Actually, recently just ranked by Travel and Leisure Magazine as the number one city for food and drink in America. True story. Fantastic. So we decided that we're going to show off that city and also show off cuisines from regions all over the country. This is an event for anybody who plans their vacations around food. So we're putting it together. We are uh, thrilled that Chef Matt Jennings, who runs Farmstead there in Providence and has been recognized uh, a couple of years now by the James Beard Foundation Awards and has won the Koshan 555 competition three years in a row, uh, has been named uh, one of the most sustainable chefs in America by Mother Nature Network, has been named by Food and Wine Magazine as one of uh, the 40 under 40 big thinkers. Uh, just uh, tons of accolades for this guy and he has agreed to come in and give the keynote address at this event. We've got a cocktail reception as part of it. We've got, uh, you know, food truck circle. We've got breakout sessions with different chefs and different food producers from different regions speaking. It's going to be fantastic. So if you like to travel and you like food, and I know you do because that's why you listen to this podcast, this is an event for you. You can find all the details over at the website Taste Trekkers, T R E K K E R S dot com. Find everything you need to know about that. But in order to make this event happen, we need your help. All right? This doesn't just happen by magic. We need to raise enough capital in order to make this event a reality. A uh, little over 12 grand is how much we need to raise. So to do that, we are launching a Kickstarter campaign. If you don't know about Kickstarter, here's the way it works. With Kickstarter, you set a goal, how much you need to raise, and then you go out and you reward people for pledging uh, to support that goal. You know, so you come in and you say, look, you know, I will pledge, you know, $35 or $50 or, you know, $500, whatever it is, whatever makes you feel comfortable. And we reward you at different levels. So you could get tickets to the event, you could, you know, get a cool tasting tour that goes along with the event, all kinds of stuff. So um, we really want you to help out. And we're asking you to do two things. First, obviously, make a contribution, support taste trackers. And second, Please spread the word through social media, get on your Facebook page, get on Twitter, let people know that we are raising money for the nation's first ever food tourism conference. Uh, let's make this happen. Let's make this a reality. I really need your help to get this done. Second, as always, got to talk about Mystery Meat Dinners. Mystery Meat is a social dining group started in Boston a few years ago. It's a bunch of foodies get together to enjoy a restaurant with uh, each other, um, and they're all really passionate foodies, but here's the catch. Nobody knows where they're going until 24 hours in advance. So when you buy your tickets, you don't know where it's going to be. You don't know where you're eating. You don't know who you're eating with. 
So it's for adventurous foodies only, but it's a great experience for everybody involved. Uh, you can sign up if we've got it going on in your city, which is San Francisco, uh, Boston, Seattle, St. Louis soon. Uh, head over to mysterymeet, M-E-E-T dot org. Click the big orange button and sign up for the next dinner. If we don't have it in your city, get some friends to sign up. And when we see a lot of interest, we will start them in your city as well. That's actually what happened with St. Louis. We just saw this groundswell of people who are interested. So we're like, done. We're going to start them there. That could be your city. So head on over to Mystery Meet, M-E-E-T dot org. Click the big orange button and get your invitation. We are talking to David Barrow. He is the filmmaker behind uh, Farm City State. It is a film that sets out to find out if a city like Austin can actually feed itself uh, using nothing but locally grown food. Uh, speaking of hard questions, uh, you asked me one earlier. Tell me again what it is. What was the popular crop that was grown east of the metropolitan area of Austin within the last century. I mean, this area was one of the largest producers of a specific crop. Mm. Is this a crop that was edible or used for food? Yes. Damn, I so wanted the answer to be hemp, too. Um, <laughs> Me too, but it's... <laughs> it's not going to be something obvious like corn or wheat. Um, I, I don't know. I have no idea. What, what is it? Spinach. Really? Spinach. Texas and specifically the Austin area was one of the largest spinach producers in the United States back in the day. So I don't think of that. I mean, I think of Texas as being, you know, like a desert. And, uh, you know, again, I'm better at eating the food than I am at growing it. But I, I would not have thought that spinach would come from an environment like Texas. I never would have guessed that. Right. Well, I mean, Texas does have its desert areas, but it also has very lush forest land and hill country land that grows wine and olives. And then it has central Texas that is a great produce producer. And, and so I don't know if you know the answer to this, but uh, do we have any idea why it is no longer a big spinach growing area? I have asked that to several of the farmers who own land and farm land on the same sort of properties. Uh, and no one can give me an answer. Wow. I asked you for a restaurant recommendation. Tell me what you came back with. So one of the Austin restaurants that I like, and I've only been once, granted, uh, but one of the ones that I support is Lin Hua. And Todd Dupelchan and his wife own it, and it's down in South Austin. Um, and they are a locally sourcing restaurant that is brilliant. They seat between 32 and 36 people. I, I can't remember the right number. Um, but they they do a great job. You, you basically get a choice. You have four sections. Uh, you kind of like your appetizer. Then you have land. You have sea, and then you have dreams. And then these sections, you know, you get to pick one of three options. So you get an appetizer. You get something from the land, and you get something from the sea, um, or you can have one of the dreams. So one of the desserts, and you get three courses for you know, in the mid thirties. Oh, that's not bad at all. And it's all locally sourced. Yeah. So I think the concept is, is brilliant and everything came out technically great. All right. Uh, so the restaurant's Linois. Thank you for the recommendation. Are you ready to play a little game? Let's play a little game. <laughs> all right. This game is called out of the frying pan. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you for a series of rapid-fire recommendations, just tell me the first thing that pops into your head. Okay. Obviously, we've been talking about locally sourcing food. When you go to buy meats, do you have a favorite butcher shop that you go to? There are two butcher shops that I love going to in Austin, and it's Daidui and Salt and Thyme, and I can't choose between them. And what can I get at each? Well, Daidui, you're going to be able to get anything from duck to wild boar, to different types of sausages and uh, really well prepared condiments, mustards, pickles, etc. In salt and thyme, you're going to get any. You know, it's a it's a butchery shop in Slumeria, so you're going to be able to get salamis. You're going to be able to get cured meats, uh, but you'll also be able to get the sausages as well. Nice. Uh, what about cheeses? Where do you get those? Uh, cheese is two different places. Full Quiver Cheese, which is located here in the Austin area, which is a local cheese. But then there's a cheese shop, and it's called Antonelli's Cheese Shop, and it's brilliant. It is in central Austin, and they bring in cheeses 
from not just Texas, but from all over the United States and the world. And they will spend the time with you to make sure you get exactly what you want. Oh, that's a nice touch. What about food trucks? I know that craze has hit Austin. Do you have a favorite food truck? My favorite food truck actually doesn't exist anymore. It was called the Odd Duck Trailer. And it is now being turned into a brick and mortar restaurant. Oh, wow. Well, then that's a good reason to not exist anymore. <laughs> yes, it is. What do they serve? Uh, they served all local food. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. See, it's a booming industry. Uh, did you have a favorite local chef or a favorite chef that you follow? I have several favorite local chefs. Uh, one of them is going to be Sonia Cote, who is a very passionate individual who runs the Homegrown Revival supper club series and then also owns hillside pharmacy uh, but james holmes of olivia is a brilliant mind uh, he owns two restaurants here in austin and then finally i would i, I would say todd from lenoir I, I think he's doing some really interesting things and he's combining flavors that not many others in austin are doing so he's using the same ingredients but he is executing them in different ways. All right, we're talking about locally grown foods. Of course, we need to talk about one of the most important food groups, alcohol. Uh, is where do you get your local spirits? There is is two companies that I'd recommend. One of them is Bone Spirits, and they actually are a locally produced spirit company, and they have a moonshine, a corn whiskey, a vodka, and a gin. And I, I believe that their gin is quite versatile. It's aromatic. Uh, their their vodka is um, it stands on its own legs. Their moonshine is quite mixable. Their corn whiskey will meet the standards of all all of its others brothers and sisters and stuff like that. And then the other thing that I would recommend is Dripping Springs, and they use Hill Country water, uh, so it's fresh natural springs water. Um, on a summer day, there's nothing better than some uh, some vodka and whatever you got lying around the house. Okay, and last question. If you were to hold a rap party for a film, where would you hold it? If I was going to hold a rap party for a film, it's going to be one of two places. A, the Alamo Draft House, because it's completely indicative Austin. It is grown here, it is matured here, and it is become a play. It's, a, it's an institution. So it's either going to be the Alamo Draft House or I would host it out at one of the urban farms here in Austin with a blow up screen, a musician and a full goat and a full pig being roasted for the party. Nice. Well, either way, I hope I get invited to the party. That sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Come on down here in a couple of months. All right. Thank you so much for playing. Uh, your restaurant recommendation is Lin Hua. You can find that at 1807 South First Street in Austin, or you can find it online. It's L E N I O R restaurant.com the film is farm city state we're going to throw a trailer up on the mystery meat website so that people can see you can also head over to the uh, website what's the website for the film if people want to go check it out www.farmcitystate.com and david if people want to follow you on social media how can they do that oh they can either follow me via the film's twitter account which is at farm city state or my own personal account which is at Anchor HD, A-N-C-H-O-R-H-D. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. This film sounds fascinating, and I wish you the best of luck, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, I'm really excited to find out uh, if Austin can, in fact, feed itself. We're going to be sharing the message, and we're looking forward to it. I really appreciate it. This has been Mystery Meets Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Seth Ressler. Uh, of course, if you want to get an invite to a Mystery Meat dinner, uh, all you have to do is head over to mysterymeat.org, -E click the big orange button that says Get an Invitation, and sign up. If we don't have them in your town yet, get a couple friends to sign up, and we'll start one there soon. Uh, also, you can find links to a bunch of the stuff that David and I talked about in this episode on the Mystery Meat website. While you're there, you might as well follow us on Twitter. We're mystery underscore meat. Uh, we're also on Facebook. And you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes while you're there. Leave a nice review. Finally, if you are a food blogger or food event organizer or food filmmaker, whatever, if you want to be on the show, we'd love to have you as a guest. Just click the Contact Us link and send us an email and we'll schedule you on. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. 
This has been Mystery Meets Find Dining Podcast. You can find links to the websites mentioned in this episode at mysterymeetsmeet.org slash podcast. Thank you for listening.